it's Kira and welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be talking you through all of the books that I read in the month of July, which turned out to be a really, really good reading month for me. I ended up reading a total of 10 books and also one short story and it was such a good reading month but also felt like such a long month that when I came back to look at all of the books that I'd read during July I couldn't quite believe that they were all read in the same month because some of them from the beginning of the month felt like they'd been read so so long ago but lo and behold they were all part of one month and without further ado I have quite a lot of books to talk about so let's jump straight into it. So if you watched my reading wrap up at the end of last month so the wrap up for June you might remember that I did a 24 hour readathon which was themed around Rory Gilmore and I basically read books that had been mentioned in the Gilmore Girls TV show because I just love Gilmore Girls so much. I'll have that linked for you so you can go and watch it if you're interested because honestly it was one of my favourite 24 hour readathons that I've done so far and I just love 24 hour readathons so that is saying something because it was just so much fun to try and become Rory for a day but essentially I ended up doing that readathon on the 30th of June and the 1st of July so obviously crossed over two months so I ended up mentioning one of the books that I read during that readathon in my last wrap up and then the other two books from that day I'll be talking about now. So the first book that I picked up in July but the second book from that readathon was one that had been on my shelves for a very very long time and that was Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen which still holds the top spot in my opinion for the most beautiful book cover on my shelves. It is honestly just so gorgeous. The shade of pink is exquisite but then I also just love the fact that it has a teacup on there because as you may or may not know I am a big lover of tea and so this cover is just everything to me and it was a Jane Austen book that had been on my shelves for a really long time. I was in a bit of an Austen mood earlier this year and was really loving getting through quite a few of her books and so this one just seemed like a perfect one to move on to next and I loved it. I ended up giving it four stars. This is a Jane Austen book which focuses on two sisters. We have Marianne and Eleanor. And despite being sisters and having a really close relationship, they're also very, very different from one another. Marianne is all about kind of like emotion and romance and love, whereas Eleanor is a little bit more sort of reserved and focused on logic. And so we see that kind of coming out in the way that these two sisters respond to romance and finding marriage suitors throughout the book. They're also from a family that isn't very well off. And so for that reason, marriage is a really, really important part of the book and finding a partner that will allow them to still live a nice lifestyle is of course really important and I think Jane Austen always does a really great job of exploring the sort of institute of marriage as it was during the time that her books were written because of course back then marriage was more than just simply a declaration of love and of romance and it was quite often more of a calculated societal move all about sort of finding a partner who benefited you but that you also liked and could stand to be around and so we see this sort of split in two in this book because we have Eleanor who is very much aware of this and of course deep down wants to be with someone that she likes but also recognises that potentially like status and security are more important than having like a sort of swept away type of romance and then we of course have Marianne who is the younger of the two sisters and is far more focused on romance and cannot accept anything less than absolute perfect love and romance and this of course comes up in lots of ways throughout the book and it's just a really really nice story. There were a few things about this book that I found a little bit less in enjoyable than some of Jane Austen's other books and that mostly came down to the fact that this is the first time I've read Jane Austen book which has like two protagonists and I felt like it felt a little bit contrived in the way that she went about exploring both of their stories because like I said love and romance are, are a big part of this book and we have these two sisters who each go through a few different experiences with romance but it just felt a little too like a novel and not quite believable because it was almost too convenient how these romances went about not in the sense that they followed a really clear trajectory but just in the sense that we would say have 
Eleanor and her romantic interest and then something would happen that would cause them to have to separate for a while and then literally the very next page someone who was a love interest of Marianne would turn up and then a few chapters later he would have to be taken away for a while and then all of a sudden Eleanor's love interest is back and so we had this almost like it just felt a little bit too convenient and just didn't feel like an accurate representation because what are the chances that that is exactly how something would happen and it just felt a little too calculated and sort of planned out and that just kind of slightly broke the immersion for me because it didn't feel quite as real as some of Jane Austen's other books. Nevertheless I did still really really enjoy it. Of the two sisters I found myself having a little bit more affinity with Marianne and her sort of love of nature and being sort of swept away by romance and stuff just felt a little nicer and I felt a little bit more of a connection there but in all honesty I really liked both sisters and how they brought out different parts of each other and had very different characteristics so I really enjoyed this one and this was my favourite book that I read during that Rory Gilmore 24 hour readathon. And then the other book that I managed to complete for the Rory Gilmore 24 hour readathon, although technically I guess it's two books, they're part of a binder but they are technically two separate stories but I read them both and they are Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. I found it really difficult to determine how to rate this one because I enjoyed Alice's Adventures in Wonderland quite a lot and I gave that four stars but then Alice Through the Looking Glass just didn't feel quite as magical or immersive to me and I ended up giving that one two stars so I guess the average rating here would have to be three but essentially I found Alice's Adventures in Wonderland to be a really really fun and whimsical book. It also felt very apt to read that one whilst doing a readathon which was about Gilmore Girls because there was a lot of like nonsense speak and a lot of fast-paced change and a lot of adventure and it kind of felt very reminiscent of the way that Rory and Lorelai talk so fast and have such like silly jokes with one another especially when they drunk a lot of coffee and there definitely felt to be a little bit of a similarity between the sort of oddities of this book and the oddities of Gilmore Girls and both have such a like charm to them which I felt was really really nice and I loved that. I also loved in the first book in this edition, so Alice Adventure in Wonderland, the fact that there were a lot of poems, there were songs and there were also parts where the text was like written in different shapes so there was one section in particular where a mouse was telling a tale, but the mouse's tail was written in the shape of a mouse's tail, which I just thought was so funny and clever. And it's obviously just something very like little to add to a book, but especially given that this is a children's book, I feel like adding in those little extra bits just makes it even more immersive. So I loved Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but then I got into Through the Looking Glass and it just didn't quite pull me in in the same way. And I honestly just cannot really put my finger on why potentially it was just because I was coming towards the end of 24 hours of reading and I was a little bit over it maybe but all on, in all honesty I just don't I don't really know I didn't love Through the Looking Glass but Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was really really fun and I was glad to have finally read it. My next read for July was something that was very very highly anticipated it was the start of quite a big reading quest which is actually still going on and that was a quest which I have titled the Fellowship of the Read Along. This is a read along of the Lord of the Rings series that I'm hosting along with my friend Lucy. We started on the 1st of July and we've gone through up until the 14th of August and we're reading the three books that make up the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So at the beginning of July, I of course started off with The Fellowship of the Ring and I actually ended up doing this as a 24 hour readathon as well. And again, I'll have that linked down below so you can see all of my thoughts on it. But to summarize, I loved it and gave it five stars. Did I just say gave it? Honestly, sometimes I do wonder how I managed to get an English degree and how I have a booktube channel because when I come to film sit down videos, all grammar and speech knowledge goes out of the window. But what I'm trying to say is that I loved The Fellowship of the Ring so much and I gave it five stars. That's better. But I was really nervous going into this book. It's an adult high fantasy, which is something I haven't read very much of whatsoever. The only other real example I have to compare it to is Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin. And I'm partway through that series and so far I'm really loving it, but I haven't really delved any further into the realm of adult high fantasy. Because in all honesty, I have loads of other things I wanna read as well and adult high fantasy is kind of terrifying. So I was really excited to read this one because Lucy has spoken so high 
entirely of it, but also a little bit nervous because I had of course committed to reading the full series for the Fellowship of the Read Along and I was really nervous that I'd start this first book and not like it and then I would have to continue on with a series that I didn't enjoy. But luckily I got into this one and all of my fears disappeared because honestly this book is just so so good. It's one of those reading experiences that feels a little bit surreal because of how much information, context and history Tolkien has managed to weave into every single page. You just get the sense that there is so much world left to be uncovered and that there's probably hundreds and thousands of pieces of information about this world that Tolkien just didn't even have chance to fit into this book because he just manages to weave so much context in but in a way that doesn't feel dull or info dumpy at least for me it feels like it's just sort of naturally woven in there are parts that feel a little bit heavy on information but at the same time it's all so interesting you are exposed to so many different worlds characters races of creatures and different languages and all that kind of stuff and there is a lot of information to take in and yet it's just so immersive. So far I have to say that The Fellowship of the Ring is my favourite in the series. I'll talk a little bit more about the second book in the series later on but for now The Fellowship was absolutely incredible. It obviously details Frodo's journey as he takes on the title of being the bearer of the ring and he is essentially tasked with trying to get rid of it. He's joined by lots of other people on this task and it's of course not an easy journey and yet at the beginning of this book you do kind of get the vibe of just this really lovely friendly adventure with friends as you're off on this quest and because we're following at the beginning of the book just a group of hobbits who haven't ever really sort of left the Shire there is this almost sense of wonder as they explore so many areas that they either hadn't even heard of or had only heard of in stories and tales and fables and it just seems like such an immersive and enriching experience as you are just sort of taken on this like epic epic journey and it's just so incredible. My favourite characters in case you're wondering are Sam who is just the most precious person I've ever come across ever and also Frodo who I love and I said to Lucy whilst I was reading this book and I mentioned it in my vlog as well that Sam from this book was giving me a lot of similar vibes to Samuel Tarly from Game of Thrones and having done a little bit more research it would seem that Sam and John's relationship and Sam as a character in Game of Thrones is very much based on Sam from this book and Sam and Frodo's relationship and honestly I just knew it when I read it I was like this has to have been what inspired George to write Sam Tarly because they just felt like such beautifully similar characters and I love them both. So essentially this was incredible, it has opened up a whole new world for me, literally such an incredible new world but also in the sense that I now feel a little bit more at ease in tackling more adult fantasy because this has shown me that Although it is dense and there is a lot of information, it's also a very worthwhile reading experience. So the next book I picked up was actually for part of a book club that I'm part of and that is the E equals MC squared book club. This is a book club that I'm in with a couple of friends, M from the channel A Little Writer M and also Molly from the channel Mind of Molly. I'll link them both down below as well as the live show for this book that I'm about to talk about. And this was our first book club pick. It was picked by M and honestly she could not have picked a better book because it was just such an incredible read and it was The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa. This is a dystopian and it was so so interesting. It's set on an island and on this island things simply disappear from existence. This can be anything from something as small as maybe a particular type of flower, a certain type of material, maybe something physical like a mug, maybe mugs disappear from existence and then it moves on to things that are really really big like even potentially things like you know, books or computers, literally anything can disappear. It can be super small or really, really impactful. But what happens is as soon as that item disappears from existence, basically every trace of it is purged and wiped from the tr like face of the island. It just simply disappears. And then most people just simply forget about it. They forget that it ever existed and they just move on with their lives. They maybe feel like a slight sense that something is missing for a while, but then they forget and it just kind of moves on and that thing is no longer in existence. 
It's also sort of monitored and policed by a group called the Memory Police who essentially just ensure that every trace of whatever has supposed to have gone missing is gone and that there's nothing else that resembles it or allows it to stay in people's memories. And that is how this kind of works. Most people just forget. But then there are certain people who just simply cannot forget. They remember everything and they just have this ability to hold on to everything that for some reason everyone else forgets. And because of this, there's sort of a danger in these people because they stand in the way of the memory police and their ultimate goal, which is to ensure that these things are forgotten. And so these people are, if they're caught, rounded up and taken away. And we assume as readers that I guess they are just killed and disposed of because they just simply stand in the way of the overall goal of the memory police. However, like in any society where major oppression happens, there are certain people who are willing to put themselves at risk in order to try and protect these people who are at risk of being taken by the memory police. So certain people try and hide people and protect them and keep them hidden from existence. But of course, that is extremely risky and very, very dangerous. And so in this book, we have our main character who is an author. Her mother and father are both dead and we don't really know much about her history. But all we know is that she's an author and she lives on this island. She's someone who simply forgets everything. But then she comes across someone who does remember stuff. And then she's faced with this dilemma of trying to figure out exactly what she wants to do with this piece of information. We also see her as an author with some insights into her works. And those works are very symbolic for what the author kind of explores throughout the rest of this book. And Yoko Agawa does such an incredible job of painting a really, really vivid dystopian society in a relatively short amount of pages. This book is less than 300 pages. And yet this book seems so, so vivid. You feel like you are sort of thrown into the world of this book. And as things are taken from existence, you are kind of forced to kind of consider how you would deal with it. Of course, you just don't understand what that would feel like but you recognize the significance of the things and so it's just really interesting to see how these people sort of like deal with that and then you have the added issue of politics and protecting people who are oppressed and so it's a really really difficult book to read because there are some really hard things thrown in there but it's very very thought-provoking and a really really interesting read so if like me you are a fan of dystopians i would recommend this book so highly because it was incredible the next book that I picked up was a perfect summer read. Honestly, it was just the ideal read for exactly when I picked it up and I'm so glad that I read it when I did. It's a historical fiction set in the 1920s and it just gives off such incredibly like extravagant summer party vibes that it was just the perfect book for this time of year. I read this one on recommendation from my friend Meg from the channel Pride and Fiction and I'm so glad that I finally listened to her recommendation and picked this one up because it was was so good and I can now 100% see why this book is one of her favourites and why this author is one of her favourite authors because it's just so amazing and I'm now passing on that good deed of really like recommending this book as much as I can because it was so good and I just want everyone to read it. So that book was A Sky Painted Gold by Laura Wood which is just such an incredibly beautiful book. I know I did say that Sense and Sensibility is my favourite book cover and that is true but this cover is definitely up there as well. I think the combination of the really deep blue base with the gold detailing is just so gorgeous and I could just sit there and shimmer the goldness of this cover all day long because it's just so mesmerising. But like I said, this is a book which is set in the 1920s. In this book, we follow our main character, Lou, who is from a really, really big family from a seaside coastal town in Cornwall. Her family isn't particularly well off. They have plenty to sort of get them by, but they live a relatively simple life. And Lou is, although she really loves her family, sort of has slightly bigger ambitions than simply getting married and staying in this town that she's lived in for her whole life. And then as Summer kind of kicks off, her sister gets married, which kind of causes her to consider what her goal is, whether she wants to just find a man and get married and have children and buy a house, or whether she potentially wants something more for herself. And she is also an author, but doesn't necessarily know how to kind of make that into a future career for herself, particularly given that it is the 1920s and you know there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of equality for women and all of that fun stuff. But essentially, as Summer kind of gets on its way, she 
she has the opportunity to get a bit of an insight into a different way of life because a group of people come to occupy this incredibly massive mansion and manor house in the town that Lou lives in and these are of course very very wealthy people. Lou somehow manages to fall into their social circle and through this little sort of coincidence she then gets introduced to this incredibly extravagant summer filled with just opulence and all kinds of extravagant summer parties and she just gets introduced to this way of life that is so different from that she's ever experienced before. Of course she has an incredible time enjoying all of this extravagance but it of course it's kind of like encourages her to consider again what she wants from life. She knows that she potentially doesn't want to stay in this town that she's sort of lived in her whole life but she also starts to realise that potentially materialistic money and all of those kinds of things won't necessarily buy her the happiness that she wants and buy her what it is that she's looking for and so she has to really consider this. The book also has romance interwoven in there of course and it's just such a lovely book it gives off such incredible summer vibes like i've already said there's so much extravagance and just like drama but it's also just really really captivating all the way through the book definitely gives off being set in the 1920s and surrounding a lot of very over-the-top parties a lot of gatsby vibes and that is definitely by a conscious decision from laura wood because each of the sections of this book there are three starts with a Gatsby quote which was very much appreciated by me because it's one of my favourite books and all in all I just think this is such an incredible 20s historical fiction and I loved it. And then having reignited my passion for the 1920s and of course for The Great Gatsby I decided it was the perfect time to reread The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald which is one of my favourite books and honestly it was the perfect time to reread it because like A Sky Painted Gold this is a 1920s book although this one was actually written in the 1920s which is set over the course of a summer and again really focuses on the theme of opulence, extravagance and materialisticness and kind of just looks at whether you can ever really buy happiness. Spoiler alert, no. But essentially this book is just incredible. It focuses on the contrast between old money and new money and all kinds of other things about love and again really focuses on love and whether or not love is important for marriage or whether marriage should be more of a conscious social decision and it looks into all kinds of things in a really really short amount of pages but F. Scott Fitzgerald just has such an incredible way of writing. It's so vivid, it uses so much imagery and I just think it's incredible. This is definitely Definitely like a one day read I think it's something that you can get through really really quickly and there are just so many incredible quotes in it and honestly I'm just obsessed so I think my favorite quote of all time pretty much comes from this book and that is life starts all over again when it gets crisp in the fall and oh, I just love that because I'm a big fan of autumn but I loved this book and it was perfect because having just finished sky painted gold I was just enjoying all of those 1920s vibes and it was such a mood <laughs> So the next book I picked up was actually a short story. It was part of the Different Seasons collection, which is a group of four novellas by Stephen King. I only read one of them in July, but I also read one in June. So perhaps I'll read one in August and one in September as well, just to complete the collection. But essentially I read The Body in July and I really, really liked it. I ended up giving it four stars, I think, because it wasn't quite as good as some of the full length Stephen King novels I've read, but it was still a really, really great story. I read The Body because I've been a really big fan of the film version for such a long time, pretty much for as long as I can remember. The film is called Stand By Me and it is such a good film. I'm honestly just obsessed with it because like I said, I've loved it for literally as long as I can remember and it's just so, so good. And so I wanted to finally read the book version and see what the film was based on. And honestly, the film is actually such a faithful adaptation. So if you've seen the film and enjoyed it, you will almost definitely enjoy the book as well. It's a really simple premise and essentially it just follows four boys who are between the summer of being like 12 and 13 and they've got like a really hot summer a weekend ahead of them they don't really have anything to do and then one of them overhears their brothers talking about seeing a body along the railway line quite a way out of town and they decide to take on the challenge of trying to go and find this body and being the people to sort of call it in and notify the authorities that this body has been found and so that is the overall goal of this journey but essentially we just see these boys on this kind of like journey that's like a pivotal time of their life and they're kind of like growing up and trying to sort of figure out 
life and being a teenager and all of that stuff and it's written retrospectively so we have the perspective of the main character Gordon who is now an adult and an author but he's sort of recalling what happened in the summer when he was 12 and it's just a really really nice story it gives off a very nostalgic vibe there's kind of like a darker undertone in the sense of the fact that they're trying to find a body but as Stephen King books go it's relatively light-hearted and just like nice and nostalgic rather than being focused on anything too dark or gory or paranormal and so it was a kind of like a bit of a sort of change of pace for Stephen King but really enjoyable. Of course it's a novella, this one was 200 pages long so it was really quick to get through and like I said being a big fan of the Stand By Me film I knew I was going to enjoy this one and it definitely didn't disappoint. But then moving straight back into all things gory and dramatic and thrilling I ended up picking up The Chalk Man by CJ Tudor. I was really excited to pick this one up because at the end of last year I read The Taking of Annie Thorne, also written by CJ Tudor, and I really enjoyed it. This one, however, wasn't quite as good. I ended up giving this one three stars. It was still really enjoyable and very quick to get through, but just not quite as good as I anticipated. One thing I did really like about this book though was the way that it was told like narratively. I liked the narrative structure because it's a book which is told across two timelines. We have a present day timeline set in 2016 and then we have a past timeline set in 1986 and the events of the 1986 timeline kind of influence and impact what eventually happens in 2016. So kind of starting with what happens in 1986, we follow our main character Eddie who is the protagonist in both timelines and Eddie is part of a group of friends who go to the fair one day and Eddie there witnesses a really tragic accident and that kind of kicks off a very dramatic series of events that takes place over a summer holiday. Following on from this tragic accident, Eddie and his friends go about the rest of their summer not really too affected by the accident and then they eventually start sort of writing notes to each other and sending each other secret messages written in chalk and they write these outside each other's houses to kind of have like a cryptic way to send each other signs and tell each other where to meet and when. And so this is all well and good but then these chalk figures seem to start taking on a life of their own. So of course that is one very dramatic turn of events and there's sort of a question about whether there's someone playing a trick on them or whether or not these chalk figures have some kind of paranormal quality. We then also have several dramatic things happening with people turning up in town and not necessarily being very trustworthy and of course there are bodies because this is a thriller. Then taking that across into the present day timeline, Eddie is still living in the same town that he was in when this dramatic turn of events happened. His friendship group has kind of crumbled away but a couple of them are still left and things are kind of just going on as normal but then signs start creeping up that start bringing things up that happened back in that past timeline. Someone is bringing things up and trying to pull them back into a mystery that was left unsolved and then other people start turning up who seem very interested as well and there's a lot of mistrust and mystery surrounding some unanswered questions from 1986. Although I've explained it in the sense of the past and present, the chapters alternate so you are sort of constantly getting filled in with little bits of information until the end when you kind of finally understand what has happened and so it alternates between 1986 and 2016 all the way through and eventually you build up a full picture about what has gone on. Now most of this book was really interesting and I really enjoyed it however I found the ending to be a bit of a cop out. I felt like there were a lot of different ways it could have gone and lots of different things were kind of raised and set up and I feel like the eventual conclusion and the eventual villain just felt a little bit too like underwhelming almost like that all of the terrible things that had happened just sort of conveniently got pinned on one character and it kind of became almost like a movie villain and just kind of lost the depth that had been built up throughout the rest of the book. So aside from the conclusion, which I was certainly disappointed by, I did enjoy this book and it was definitely what I would look for from a thriller. There were lots of questions, lots of mystery, drama and uncertainty and overall it was definitely an interesting book. The next book I picked up was without a doubt my favourite read throughout July. It was incredible but I was honestly nervous about picking this book up because 
because of some of the comparisons that have been drawn to this book and one of my favourite books and also from the author to my favourite author and I was excited about this if it was true but also apprehensive in case the comparisons weren't something that I recognised and then I kind of didn't enjoy it as much just because I was expecting it to be something it wasn't but luckily those fears were anything but valid because this book was incredible and the book I'm talking about is Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan. Nisha is an Irish author and the comparisons I've seen drawn are probably to no surprise to any of you between this book and Normal People and between Nisha Dolan and Sally Rooney. And in particular, there is a quote on the back of this book from the Irish Times, which says, more than lives up to the hype, likely to fill the Sally Rooney shaped hole in many readers lives. Now this obviously compelled me to pick up the book and buy it because I love Sally Rooney so much. However, it was also a subject of a little bit of apprehension because I just didn't know whether that was going to be true or not and if I was then going to judge this book harshly if it wasn't quite what I was looking for but in actual fact it was incredible. There are definite similarities between the subject matters of Nisha's book and Sally Rooney's book and I have seen this book specifically compared to Normal People but in actual fact I feel like this book takes parts of Normal People and parts of Conversations with Friends and is essentially an amalgamation of everything that makes Sally Rooney so great. However, while similar themes and subjects are explored in this book to the subjects that are explored in Sally Rooney's books, I don't want it to seem like I'm overly comparing the two because Nisha has a very unique way of writing and she has her very own style and it doesn't feel like a carbon copy of anything that Sally Rooney does but because of the ways that she explores relationships I feel like if you enjoy Sally Rooney's writing and if you enjoy the themes and ideas that she explores in her books then you'll be likely to enjoy this one as well. In this book we follow our main character Ava who is a graduate from Ireland who has moved across to Hong Kong to teach English as a second language. She's not exactly thriving there and doesn't know what she wants to do with her life but she ends up meeting a very interesting man called Julian who is an investment banker at a bank in Hong Kong and he is extremely wealthy. They kind of spark a relationship that's not really a relationship and so I guess this is where the Marianne and Connell vibes come out in the comparisons between this book and normal people because there's a definite connection and spark between these two characters and a lot of care is sort of shared between them. I'm not sure I'd go as far as love as such but there's definitely a spark and connection between them and they respect each other and enjoy spending time with each other and feel kind of connected on an intellectual level. And so there's a definite similarity here between these characters and Sally Rooney's Marianne and Connell because these characters definitely have this connection with each other and yet there's an apprehension to really label the relationship or to take that step further and sort of become a couple. And yet this connection with Julian kind of allows Ava to settle into her life in Hong Kong and gives her a little bit more purpose. But then Julian ends up going away to work in England and leaves Ava in his apartment and there she's kind of stuck because she starts to question how she's treated by Julian, whether or not he really values her and what she wants. And then Ava meets a secondary romantic character called Edith and Edith kind of is everything that Ava is lacking from her relationship with Julian. Edith kind of makes her feel valued and they have like a connection that feels like they can sort of openly enjoyed spending time with each other without constantly thinking about whether the other one is judging them or whether or not they can say certain things and I guess she feels more like an equal to Edith and so she has this basic issue of essentially figuring out who she wants to be with and how she can be happy and basically what she wants from her life. And so in this sense and the sense that she's exploring her romantic feelings with multiple people, it gives off conversations with friends vibes and just in general, it gives off those vibes of exploring the complexities of relationships and the fact that relationships are certainly not as simple as simply just meeting someone and falling in love and that's that. Not to say that that never happens, but it's not always the case. And this book explores the sort of reality of making mistakes and making wrong decisions in relationships and starting to regret them, of how the fact that meeting other people causes you to reflect on your past relationships and potentially even your current relationships and just shows how all of these things intertwine and cause Ava to figure out what she wants in order to grow and become the person that she wants to be. I feel like that description sounds very spoilery but I'd like to assure you that it's not, that's just the way that this book is framed. So just to reassure you in case you're concerned that I've just given everything away, I'm just going to read the blurb because that 
summarises it probably a little bit better than I do. But essentially it says that Ava is in Hong Kong and she is there kind of on a gap year, but she's there to make her own money and she's not sure what to call it. But it involves a badly paid job in Hong Kong teaching English grammar to rich children. Julian, who likes to spend money on Ava and lets her move into his guest room. Edith, who Ava meets while Julian is out of town and actually listens to her when she talks. Money, love, cynicism, unspoken feelings and unlikely connections. Exciting times ensue. So again, this kind of highlights the fact that it kind of explores her relationships with two people and the ways that these relationships caused her to reflect on herself and on each of those other relationships in turn and essentially just to reflect on exactly what she wants to do. This is a book which looks into a lot of self-growth and I guess self-image and who Ava thinks that she is and who she wants to be and how she can get there and I just think it's a great book not only in the way that it explores romance but I'd highly recommend this book to anyone who is in well to anyone full stop but particularly to anyone who is maybe in their early 20s and is kind of dealing with the issue of what on earth to do with their life. This book explores that in the sense of romance but also in the wider sense of where to live, what career to pursue and all kinds of other things and I feel like it's just a book which explores that things can be complex and that it doesn't always have to follow a simple trajectory and that's not always the way that life goes. So I loved this book, it was incredible and I hope Nisha Dolan writes more things in future because I loved this one a lot. Next up I picked up a murder mystery which had been on my TBR for a really long time and I was really excited to finally get to it and that was The Hunting Party by Lucy Foley. I really enjoyed this one and ended up giving it four stars and honestly I haven't read very many murder mysteries. It's a style of book that I really want to read more of but so far this one is my favourite. There were a couple of flaws for me, it wasn't a perfect book but for the most part it was really really enjoyable and I do feel like as murder mysteries go this one had a very unique style. It was told across two timelines which I absolutely loved, especially because quite uniquely these timelines were very very close together and I'll explain that more in just a moment but for now I'll say that this book has two timelines which as I've already mentioned in a couple of the books I've explored in today's wrap up I really really like and then also it not only has two timelines but also multiple perspectives. So this book ticks off two things that I absolutely love immediately. And essentially this is a book which focuses on a group of friends who spend every New Year's together and this year they've decided to go off to a very very remote cabin in the Scottish Highlands and there this murder mystery ensues. But at the beginning of the book we just see this group of friends heading up to Scotland and although these are really old friends who've known each other for a really long time for the most part, there are already cracks starting to show just on the journey up to the cabin. And these are of course kind of exacerbated when they're sort of forced to be in such a remote location with no one else to interact with but each other. So like I said, for the most part, these are people that have known each other for a really long time. Most of these friends met at Oxford University, so they're in their 30s at the point where the book is in the present day, but they've known each other since university, except for two of the characters who are partners of people in the group. One of these partners is the newest edition and she's called Emma and she is absolutely desperate to solidify her place in the group so she actually planned this year's New Year's trip, planned the location and she's so excited to show it off to everyone and to basically like solidify her place in the group and particularly she really wants to be great friends with one of the other girls in the group and so she's constantly trying to show off to her and basically just like kind of like concrete herself within this group and find a solid place for herself and just like basically confirm that she's best friends with this girl essentially. And so we have that dynamic, we have older friends who are kind of drifting apart and we have a few secrets that are gradually starting to be revealed throughout the rest of the book. And then of course we have a murder, of course. So this book starts with the announcement that there has been a murder and that is in a slightly future timeline. We have basically have timelines that are like two days previous and then two days ahead and they're kind of like the before and after of the murder and they kind of merge until eventually you figure out what's gone on. So in the two days earlier timeline we basically have the friends arriving at the cabin and getting settled in and a few drama starting to happen and in the two days later timeline you know that there has been a murder and you know a body has been found but you don't know who it is and so that makes it really difficult to start making your predictions about who has committed the murder because you don't even know who the victim is and that makes this book so interesting. 
And then like I said, we also have multiple perspectives. So we're seeing from a few key perspectives. You don't have all of the friends perspectives. So I feel like that kind of knocks a few of the people out of the running in terms of who you think is gonna have committed the murder, but it still doesn't stop it from being interesting because you still have lots of other dramas and intricacies of relationships breaking down and all kinds of things like that woven in. So this is a very, very layered murder mystery because there are so many different things to unpick and you have to sort of solve both the mystery of who the victim is and also then who the perpetrator is, which I think adds a really unique and interesting twist to this murder mystery. The one thing that I wasn't sure about with this book is that one of the character's perspectives is told in a different narrative style. All of the other ones are written in first person, so you're hearing like, I saw this and I did that, and then one character has his perspective written in third person. And I wasn't sure whether that was just like a decoy or a red flag that this was the murderer or that he was connected with it, but by the end of the book I still wasn't sure what the purpose of that was and I just didn't really find that to be a necessary addition. It didn't take away from my enjoyment of the book, but it just felt like a bit of a strange addition to the story and the style. But overall, I found this book to be very captivating. It had so many layers, so many different things to try and unpick, but it also wasn't too heavy with information. So you didn't feel like you were being bogged down by the mystery. It just felt very exciting and compelling. I enjoyed this one so much that I have now ordered The Guest List, also by Lucy Foley, and I'm really excited to read that one soon, probably as we start moving towards all autumn because I just think that's going to be the perfect time to read this but I'm sure I'm going to enjoy it because this was a really like fun murder mystery that had lots of layers and lots of things to figure out and there were more mysteries than just simply the murder which I think was a really nice addition and made this book a little more sort of complex and definitely more interesting. Whew, wow we have done a lot of talking this afternoon but the next book and the final book that I picked up in July was The Two Towers by J.R.R. Tolkien, which is of course the second book in the Lord of the Rings series and my second foray into Middle Earth for the Fellowship of the Read Along. As I mentioned earlier, so far of the two books of the series that I've actually completed, The Fellowship of the Ring was my favourite and that means I didn't enjoy The Two Towers quite as much, but I still gave it five stars and it was still a great read. I won't go too far into my thoughts for this one just because it's of course the second book in a series and I don't want to give away any spoilers. I do already have a reading vlog up for this book on my channel and also the live show where Lucy and I discussed this book. So if you want to go and check that out and hear some more spoilery in-depth thoughts, please do go ahead and do that. But just to kind of summarize why I didn't enjoy this one quite as much, like I said, The Fellowship of the Ring felt more like a group of friends on this saga. There was a lot of drama and a lot of darkness surrounding it because it wasn't an enjoyable task but it still felt like this group of friends on this sort of collective journey and at the end of the fellowship of the ring this fellowship of people is kind of sort of shattered because they all kind of get split off in different directions and whilst they all still have a common goal in mind they're no longer traveling together as a fellowship and so that means that you're getting lots of different perspectives and in this instance we start this book and it's split into two parts and we don't actually see anything of Frodo and Sam until the second part of this book and obviously as I mentioned they are my favourite characters and it was a little bit sad for me to not have much insight into them until the second half just because I love them so much and I think that was what was so good about the Fellowship of the Ring was that you had so many characters and you were exposed to so many different ideas and themes but you still got to enjoy them all with all of the characters together whereas with this one you see the characters a lot more separately and you can be focusing on one character for a really really long time and not get much insight into anyone else which I think just wasn't quite as enjoyable for me. However the second half of this book really picked up pace and I enjoyed that one a lot particularly because as well as Frodo and Sam we also had a really great insight into Gollum who was such an interesting character and just added so much complexity and like tension to their part of the story so absolutely loved it and I'm really excited now to get into Return of the King. So that is my very very jam-packed July reading wrap-up. I obviously had a great time getting through lots and lots of books in July and I feel like I really maximised that month. July was my final month off work before 
before going back into the office after lockdown because my office is now back up and running and so I feel like July was the perfect chance to do as much reading as possible because I know that once I'm in August which is now of course I'm not having as much time for reading and so I don't think my August wrap up will be quite as jam-packed as this one but I honestly had a really great reading month I feel like I got quite a lot of variety in there because we had some classics, some romances, some historical fiction, some contemporaries, we had some adult fantasy, some thrillers and some murder mysteries. So it really ticked off pretty much every single genre going and I had a great time reading all of those books. So I hope you enjoyed hearing all of my thoughts on these books. If you've read any of them, I'd love to hear what you thought. And if not, let me know what your favorite read from July was. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.